Yeah, I just, I just wanted to come out and show my beard, so that's the presentation. I would just go <laughs> on. So yeah, uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. I know everyone just really wants to get to the airport at this point, so I appreciate uh, coming here. So my name is Matej Guyash. I'm the CEO of Datapow. A small disclaimer, I, we are partners with Databricks, so I also uh, work with Databricks or in Databricks as instructors. So um, our company, like Datapow, when we're not working with Databricks, what we do is our core competency is building data engineering, architectures, data platforms, and data science. And we had like 10 decades of, uh, 10 decades, 10 years of experience, I'm pretty old. 10 years of experience in that, but usually we come from the digital world. So most of us worked in, in digital marketing, uh, digital product, and like two years ago we moved to work with manufacturing companies, so basically brick and mortar factories. So this was kind of a surprise, so when we were go, went out, this is a totally new area, we absolutely not knew how to get into this world and what, how they work, what they do. But we have this thing in, 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 in Europe, Industry 4.0. This is not a special thing. Like in the States, it's called advanced manufacturing. In China, it's called Made in China 2025. The whole idea is that we have to digitalize manufacturing because there's a lot of things we can do by analyzing data. So this talk is somewhat non-technical because I want to introduce you to the problem space and somewhat technical because I will show you actual code, how, how, what, what, what we do. So first, let me, let me tell you why, why this whole, what is this industry 4.0 is. And the first question is, first question is like, what was the first three? So why is this the four? The first one was mechanization, which was basically the machines uh, the, uh, the, the, the conveyor belt and the manufacturing plants. Um, the second was the actual mass production, so 4T, when we had one unit which was reproduced multiple times. So before that, every unit was kind of, kind of uh, custom. And then we had the automation, and if you look at the, the dates, every time that we spent in, the, in that era is shorter and shorter. So the last one is, which is the fourth one, is, is smart factories. And basically what it means is that currently what you, what you would see in an average factory is that they don't collect any data about their manufacturing process. So usually what they do is through when, we, when Lean was introduced, they started to do paper, paper collection of data. So they just wrote up how much time it takes for one unit to come, uh, come out of, of, the, of the factory. So what we do now is we try to collect data through the manufacturing process to do certain things. And what are these things? And before I move forward, there are a lot of use cases for this. And the main, of course, the main motivation is, is, is being competitive. Industry is a huge thing in Europe. It's 80% of our export. Till March, it means the UK too. But in China, in the States, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing. So let me give you one example, or two examples actually. One is something called mass customization. So this is a Volvo. You can buy this on the website of Volvo. And you can, you can, select, the, you can select the model that's uh, on the top of the screen. And after that, you can, you can select the engine. So far, there is nothing new in this. You could do this in 10 years ago. But what's strange is that the next page, when you order your Volvo, you can customize even the color of the inner LED light. So basically, you can select these. This is Hungarian, but you can get it any, any time you go. And not just Volvo, of course. So you can select these packages, but think about this for a, for a manu from a manufacturing perspective. You're basically programming the manufacturing line. So when your car gets to the point where the doors had to be attached, your door is the next one in the line because it has maybe a double window, uh, reinforced carbon in this. So basically, we have to have a lot of IT and digitalization in the manufacturing line to be able to actually do this. Another example is in another factory uh, which creates parts for, for windows. 10 years ago, they had 100,000 elements was the, was the smallest unit that they could ship. But since windows has the same properties as concrete walls, like how they can retain heat, now, architecture, architecture and, uh, and every office you see, they have custom windows. So the parts in the windows now had to be mass customized because that's, that's the demand. So this is one example. And, the one, and this, is, this, is, this will be interesting because this will be the, the one uh, demo that I, that, I, that I will do. It's predictive maintenance. So 
When the manufacturing mass, mass production started, we had reactive maintenance, which was when the machine broke, we went there and fixed the machine. And that was bad, because once the machine broke, you had to order a part, which might have been two months, and then replace the broken part. So two months downtime is unacceptable. A, 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 a normal size factory can make one million euro in loss in a single day. So we went to preventive maintenance, which was basically, it's better if we just stop the machines every month to see if we need to order some part. But the problem with that is, of course, you have to keep a lot of inventory, really expensive parts next to the factory or in the vendor. And of course, you have to sometimes turn off the machines. But if we can collect data, temperature, vibration, the sound that these machines emit, we can start to look for patterns in that and see when the machine will broke. To give you one example, there is some high rotation parts in manufacturing, like how, let's say, the wire gets rolled up. So if once, once this middle part that rotates the drum starts to deviate, uh, the force that you need to rotate is a bit bigger, and there is vibration because it's not rotating in a perfect angle, but like this. So by looking for these signs, you can see that there is something wrong with the machine. And if you have positive samples which, about when the machine broke down, which is not a positive thing, but machine learning terminology, positive samples, you can also see what leads to these, to these errors to these malfunctions, basically. So predictive maintenance is, is one of the leading use cases in, in this digitalization. And a disclaimer, so we, this is a very cutting edge thing. You need a lot of things to do. I will talk about the challenges in this. So most factories that you will go in, you won't find this. And the reason is the, 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 the very common machine learning problems, which I will address at the end of my talk. But the point is that this is really just a very few, very advanced manufacturing technology that can do that. So OD, car manufacturing, they usually do this. But agriculture, energy sector, uh, pharmaceuticals, they, they don't really do that. Pharmaceuticals is something in the middle ground. So what are the challenges? Like, why we just don't jump in it? And why we need Spark? Let's, because at some point, this will be a Spark talk. So why do we need? So I did this usual uh, big data consultancy client base, insurance companies, banks, uh, digital products. And most of them did not really have a big data problem. So you could just use a huge machine on Azure and just run it. But in a factory, uh, you might want to sample the data 200 milliseconds, every 200 milliseconds, because to look for vibration things and electricity consumption changes, you need a resolution like 200 milliseconds. It's five times in a second. And one point of data is, let's say, 32 bytes, which is not much. It's, let's say, an integer. But you have 200 sensors in, an every, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a conveyor belt, and in one sensor, it doesn't measure just one thing, it measures multiple things. So look at, if you take a look at the, at the electricity sensor, it takes the voltage, uh, what the, the, uh, the ampere, it takes the uh, phase of the current. Basically, a normal, a normal a, a standard sensor, even if it's vibration, can measure 20 different things. And just to put that in, into perspective, this means that it's around uh, 20 terabytes a year, and this is with 200 sensors. Now, a modern CNC machine that just cuts parts out of aluminum has 1,500 of this. So that, that single CNC machine can produce around one terabyte per day uh, in raw data. And uh, this, was, this data comes from Siemens. They have in Hungary uh, a factory where they have, I think, nine of these CNC machines. So this is actually big data, and this is a problem because as we will see, and of course, if you take account some retention, like five years, it's 100 terabytes. This is basically a single machine. And it's not just the size. So a factory is usually far from your data center. So if you use like Databricks and you use Azure or any cloud provider, the latency might be 200 milliseconds. So a turnaround when you send the data and let's say you do some kind of processing, so model apply in machine learning, that goes around almost, it can be, it can be more than half a second. So cert for certain use cases, like when you want to control the manufacturing process, it's just too much. And the other problem is we are pushing through this spotty network, because usually these factories are on the countryside, so forget broadband. 
And this is a problem, how you can push so much data from such a place where the network connection is not really strong. The good thing, though, because that was quite bad so far, so the good thing is that all the technologies already exist. So just to give you our stack, of course, Apache Spark. Why would I have been here? Here. And we use Kafka. I will talk about Docker and OPC, which is a standard. And in the industry setting, having standard is extremely important because you deal with a lot of vendors. So if you have to, op if you have to write your connector, let's say your a Spark, your Spark application has to connect to multiple different vendors, the machines, it's a nonsense. So we need standardization, and OPC is one of these efforts, and it goes pretty well. All right. So I want to show something. So what about what to do with big data? And there is two terms, fog computing and edge computing. You think that I just came up with these, with these things, but they actually exist. So let me tell you what they are. We know the cloud. That's basically your cloud provider data center. So what if, if we don't want to send the data to the data center, we could send that to, the, to one network hop away from the factory, aggregate the data a little bit, and only send the aggregation. So that's fog, because that's the cloud close to the ground. But it, it's a fancy name, but think about like servers in the factory. That's a cloud computing. What's really interesting is the edge devices. So what is an edge device? That's, that's really close to the machine. And what we can do with that and, and fog is that, remember this problem? So what we could do is the factory doesn't really send the data to the cloud, to, the, your, to let's say, our Spark streaming application. But first, it sends to a middle, net, middle hop. This is our server in the factory or one network hop from the factory. And we aggregate the data there. And we might deploy some logic so it can, it can, it can give a response in, let's say, 50, millis 50 milliseconds. And we can still collect the data in the cloud so we can later train, train models and stuff. But now we have a middle ground so we can aggregate the data. So we solve the big data problem. And we also have with the quick response. What is an edge device? So this is a Cisco industrial router, which is super not interesting for you, but this can, but this can run Docker. So this can actually, you can deploy a Docker container to this router. So before your actual machine learning can respond for certain logics, for certain thresholds, you can deploy code to this router, which is just, it's not even a network hop away from our, from our sensors. It's basically the next hop. So think about this as a, as a network device. OK, so this was so far the, the, the introduction. And what I want to show you is a demo about this predictive maintenance thing. And of course, I couldn't, I couldn't use a real factory and I couldn't use a real data because it's kind of a sensitive thing. But I will tell you what we'll do. So this is one of our internal system. This is a simulator for factory. In this case, what we simulate is a syrup factory. Basically, it mixes up water, some syrup, to produce some soda. And the way it works is we have a sugar silo, a mixer plant, and the beverage silo. And this mixer plant, you can click on this one. So this contains two valves. Basically, these are shut off when we are mixing, and they are open when the mixer is filling up. And we have a motor which, which, which operates the mixer. So sometimes this is off, sometimes this is on. And if I click on this, you can see that we, we have some sensor data. And I don't want to go over this. I mean, obviously, you, can, you know what these data are because they have such a good names. But PR pressures, like the, the air pressure coming out of fans. Uh, we have T50 and T30, which are temperatures of the uh, fans, so the ones that are circulating the air, and all kinds of different uh, sensors. So th these are tags. This what I mentioned. This is one sensor, and it, it, it measures a lot of different things. By the way, this, this little simulator, what we use for is we are simulating factories. And this will provide us with the data. So this sensor data that you saw, it's pushed in Kafka. And what we will do is we will read from Kafka to do some predictions. And by the way, 
I mentioned that this, this predictive maintenance is actually pretty advanced in terms of most companies don't use this. So just to show you what is the actual reality that most companies where we are at in production is that they're having these dashboards and they have real-time real -time analytics about their manufacturing process. This also uses uh, uh, Spark structured streaming. So the data is cleaned and aggregated on certain conditions. But what they can do is that uh, they can go and see different tags. Think about sensors, but basically measurements. So what they can do is they can see that, let's say, beverage quality is a specific metric. In agriculture, you have some, uh, some thresholds like protein, acid, acid ratio, which you have to keep or you, can, you have to throw out what you produce. So we can see that the, what the beverage quality with, let's say, sugar consumption. I don't know if it actually means anything. So now what they can do is they can basically just see if how that, how that changed over time. And you think, I mean, for you, probably this is like we had that 10 years ago. In manufacturing, this is pretty new. So this is actually the reality. But in research, we are running these machine learning projects where we try to be predictive. So this is retrospective, right? We can come here and see, OK, so if the protein, protein level went down, what was the other measurement that also went down or went up? So try to correlate these uh, time series. And so this is kind of the reality. But in research, we do uh, these projects where we try to say how we can do this in a productive, uh, predictive manner. And I will talk about why this is an, a big challenge, uh, so why it's actually a, a hard thing to do that in production, apart from the fact that no one really understands in the factory why this is, <laughs> how this is works. So what we will do is two things. We will uh, run some model training, and we will pred predict in real time. So we will read in some data from Parquet. We will cache it because we will run model training on, them, on that, so it's an iterative thing. And our data set will do contain the same measurement. So this is our schema that we have, that we are coming from, that comes from the motor. So if I display this, yeah, no surprise, we have that data. By the way, this is, this, ev every line is one cycle in a machine. So this, this data set was used to find patterns. And the way they do this, these data sets is that they line up 1,000 machines they start to run these cycles in them. And then when, they, when a machine is broken, they backfill the data that how many cycles that machine was left in that, in that, um, in that cycle. So if a machine broke in the 100 cycle, they just backfill it. So 50 cycle, at 50 cycle, we had 50 cycle left. Basically, so they backfill the data. So our label column is actually backfilled. What we are trying to predict is the RUL. This is a remaining useful lifetime. So the cycles that this machine has till it will break down. And again, this is somewhat a prepped, a prepped uh, data set. But we do use this to find uh, a pattern and to, and to pre-train some models. I don't want to go into details, but I wanted to tell you this because this is our training data set. And I, I will try to zoom out because, so as you can see, this is, a, and by the way, this is not one machine. This is a population of same type machines. So this is was when machine broke down and we backfilled how many cycles we had. So in this axis, we have the remaining useful cycle. And of course, a machine will break down at some point. So every cycle, we just lower the remaining useful cycles. So what we do here, and I won't train the model because it takes, even on this sample data set, 20 minutes. Uh, I am, the, by the way, on a community edition, so you can try this too. So what we do is we just drop some, some I can show you it here. So what we will do is we will just drop some columns. We do the vector assembly. If you're ever if you're familiar with Mich Spark uh, ML library, it's pretty pretty much the same. We have to remove the labeled column for training, of course. And what we will do is we will train. Let me go down. 
So what we will train is uh, a boosting tree. This is our uh, this, this is what we'll train, and this is the boosting method. So if you're familiar with uh, XGBoost and these uh, libraries, this is basically what we do is we have, let's say, one decision tree. We take the errors and we train another tree to somehow help with the previous one. The basic idea is that these are weak learners, but if everyone can, can offset the previous error, each of them will be a weak learner, so on its, it's not a good predictor, but the whole, let's say, pipeline will be a good predictor. So that's what we do. And we, we train the model, I won't do this. And we will save this. And because we are not running in, so I will tell about the challenges, but basically this is how we, imp we deploy these products currently. So we just save it and ship it to the, to the, to the factory, usually on a pen drive. No, we use network, don't worry about it. It's cutting edge technology. So if we try to, if we, if we run this on our test data set, in the previous one we split it our data set into test and, and train, you can see that we, we, this is pretty good. And believe me, this is not bad. I mean, it's part of the reason because it's a prep data set. But we can see that we can predict how the remaining useful, remaining useful life cycle are decreasing. And you will see that there are some of these outliers. And this happens all the time because if you think about it, sometimes the temperature will go up, not because the machine are heating up, but because they closed on off the door and they forgot to turn out the air conditioning. The machine is okay, but the temperature went up. So sometimes these things happen. Okay, so we have our model. Let's do the fun part and try to do some actual predictions. So because I'm on a CE, what I will do is I will set the shuffle partitions to one because I don't want to I don't want to have a lot of partitions because on a C you have eight slots, so you would write a lot of a lot of files and it couldn't handle. And what we will do is we will basically just uh, just connect to our to the to this uh, to the Kafka cluster, which is a single Kafka node in this place in this case. And this will stream uh, the the sensor data. Of course, the sensor data doesn't have the remaining useful lifetime, right? So I can just display this, and what we will see is that in Kafka you have byte streams. So we cast that to string, but even the string will be a JSON, right? So we receive these, uh, I canceled it because I just want to show you the first few. So this is actual, like it comes from, from Kafka right now. So this is a JSON and we have all the values that we saw in the training, in the training set. So what we'll do, this is Scala magic. Basically we are creating a struct type that resembles our JSON and we use uh, select to basically from JSON, which basically flat out. So we have to, we have to create the same data frame, the same schema as our training, as our training uh, data set. So let me do that. And with display, I start this stream. And now we, what we did is we read from Kafka, flat it out from the JSON, so we have the right uh, schema. And as we can see, we have, of course, no RUAs, no remaining useful lifetime, because it comes, as, it, as we speak, from, uh, from this uh, factory simulator. And here is the good thing. So we now load the model. And if you know, if, if you don't, I don't show that this is real-time analytics, we would do the very same thing in batch. Because you probably know by now, you have so many good presentations about this, but structured swimming uses exactly the same API. So we used transform to do the predictions when we, test it, when we tested our model. We do the same thing in production. Only difference is this won't be a static data frame, read from Parquet. This will be a streamed data frame. So it won't give us a prediction once. It will give us a prediction every two seconds in this case. So every two seconds, it will give, give us a single number, which will be the remaining useful life cycle. <laughs> So let's do this. I can show you that if I transformed our streaming data set, it packed up the features that we are getting, and it attached a prediction. So now every two seconds, I get a number. What is the remaining useful life cycle? Let's select the timestamp, because I need the time series, so I need a timestamp and the prediction, what is the remaining useful cycle. And if I run this, you will see that 
This doesn't look very good because there's a lot of variation in certain measurements, so the prediction is somewhat jumping. I'm faster than Spark, but I'm not a distributed system. So what you will see, of course, we have just a few data points. It will start together. You can see some trend, but the problem right now that we're facing is that because in the data there is variety, the model will predict in somewhat a hectic manner. Think about this. Like we have vibration sensor, but if someone pushes a cart next to the machine, there will be vibration in the data not from the internal components of the machine, but because someone like went on the machine, not this one. This, usually factories are built a bit more robust. So what we can do is we can, we can somehow smooth it out by applying a rolling average. And just to show you how, Spark, how, how versatile Spark is or Databricks, we will create a SQL table on this streaming data frame, still streaming, still real time. But what will happen is we will select the predictions, the average over a, a 60 seconds window that, and we move that 60 seconds window every second. So this is a rolling average, a 60 seconds, ev 60 seconds window And if I run this, we smooth it out. And we need to smooth, because if you set a threshold, remaining useful cycle, let's alert the engineer when it's below 10, it will alert almost every day because of the variation in the data. So now, if I scroll so you can see this, of course, we do have this variation. And you don't really see too much, because at this point, we have just a few data points to count the average on. But once I let it run, you will see that the average is actually a pretty good predictor for the remaining life cycle, because these variations will be smoothed over the window, or the time window. So I will wait a little bit, uh, so we can see that the average starts to smooth out. And of course, there will be, so what is, what, is, what is the meaning of this? So this is now the remaining useful cycle. So of course, this is now, because we started from the beginning of the data, this is pretty big, pretty high, so 160. By the way, the maximum is, if I remember correctly, is like 190. Think about cycles as like 10 minutes windows. It's not actually that, but think about that as, as a time frame. So what we, are, what we are really interested in, what we use to predict the machine broke but when the machine will broke, is actually this moving average. By the way, in production, I mean, in real life, this window would be even wider. So not 60 seconds, but wider than that. So this is basically a very prediction in a nutshell. Of course, in real time, what you don't have is such a prepped data set. And we are getting aggregated data. So probably your, uh, not probably, but you, ha you need another streaming job which would aggregate the data. So that's something that we did not do this time. But now we can see a really nice moving average. Yes, I do want to cancel. OK. Oh, no share. So what are... The tech. But is there any anyone who has a non-technical role, like a manager or some in this room? All right, I will skip the organizational part then. So, what are the challenges? So, one of the problems is is the machine learning lifecycle. As kind of this is not a marketing slide that ML flow is great, but this is actually a problem. So, especially because. This whole factory setting is usually not set out to collect data for training and stuff. So we, we have a hard time actually doing this, even in research, to do these machine learning life cycles and test them. The other one is you think that sensor, because if we collect data from sensors, it will be good. So it will be clean. But that's not what happens. So we have all kinds of coding errors. Uh, network outages, we have to backfill data, we have to approximate data. So that's, I mean, that was for me at least, it was pretty an astonishing thing that we are facing the same data cleaning problems than in any other setting. Some of the things are easier. 
So, of course, you don't deal with human interaction and stuff, but that's still a problem. I won't talk about that too much. The biggest problem is the organizational part. So if you are, I mean, in, in like, actually what we are trying to deploy is not uh, boosting, uh, boosting models because the problem is that if you cannot explain your model to the, to the, to the experts in the factory has absolutely no IT background usually. These in, in, in factoring, what we have is we are IT, right? Information technology. That's probably most of your life. In manufacturing, the other word is so-called OT, with operational technology, and this two word is to totally different word. They have this totally different mindset, and it's good because they are working in this manufacturing thing for a long time and all kinds of uh, problems that they solve over time. But the, what you cannot do is you cannot come up with a fancy, really good performing model, because if you tell them that, oh, this performs really well because it has like five hidden layer, they will run away. They won't let you to deploy. And I have a slide which I won't tell you, but you, when I tell you neural nets, when I tell you a linear regression, everyone knows that these are mathematical constructs, mathematical models. I actually had talks where I had to, like, had to tell them that this, is, this won't come out of the factory and like poison them. And this is true. And I have a slide about that. Like This is what you see when you are then you put machine learning in Google, click to image search. So this is for them. When I tell them that, hey, we want to research a machine learning model in, uh, in uh, one of the works, one guy said, this is scary. And we told them that this is a machine learning model. This is just mathematical concepts. So education is really important. And I think the future in this area is not just training on on, on, uh, on evaluation the models. So we have to have explainable models. And I think what really works well is that when, the, when you weighted the futures and before you actually train the models in the future, in the feature engineering phase, you have to talk to them a lot and discuss how, what feature is really important because they have a lot of knowledge. And what, you, what we give them is those connections that and the automation what they, they, they don't see uh, in the data. So explainable models is probably one of the cornerstones of machine learning in manufacturing. Thank you very much for your, for your attention. I, act, I don't know it's not easy. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach uh, out uh, to me or to us. And thank you. Does anyone have any questions before we get on? Oh, we do. We got uh, so one quick question. So for manufacturing, uh, why do you need to sample every like 20 milliseconds? Because your prediction horizon is in terms of at least days, uh, I assume. So why do you add noise on top of uh, this data sampling thing? So the question was why do we predict on 20 minutes window or 60 seconds window? Two hundred milliseconds. Two hundred. I'm sorry. Two hundred milliseconds. Oh That's yeah. Right. Yes, because but your prediction horizon is like in days. Yeah, it's a good question, but actually, it's not for like say machine learning. So a lot of other use cases, like threshold detection and seeing like there is one one of our use cases is that sometimes machines when you start up they consume a lot of electricity and this propagates back to the network to the public network and they have to pay fines for the electricity provider because they because the, the some of the some of the attributes of electricity will be bad for the public so they have to be very careful that if it, if this starts to propagate back to the system to the to the outside world of to the grid we have to alert and certain pattern detection needs to be very high resolution to do that. So it's the original data collection. Prediction is another use case, but we do other things, not just teaching machine learning models, but hard-coded rules. But those hard-coded rules sometimes need high, high resolution. The other thing why we collect that data is because we are in a research phase for many things, and that's for some things where the change in data is very rapid. We want to preserve all the changes. And sometimes we aggregate because we just cannot process that much data. And of course, running an iterative machine learning algorithm on billions of rows is just not viable. So that's the answer. Yeah, that was not clear. Explain again, how do you aggregate the, the, the data in the middle before you're going into the cloud? Well, something yes. 
So this is the case, right? So what you could do is like if you have 200 milliseconds resolution, by the way, not everything. So for instance, temperature, we don't have to measure every 200 milliseconds. So what you do is basically you can create logic here that if the data is not changed over the last sampling, you don't send this up. You still get it for pattern recognition, but you don't send it to the cloud, so you are, you are saving up on the bandwidth. And usually you pay for the bandwidth, so they have to, have to pay for a certain provision bandwidth, so we cannot just push it over. This is one thing. And the other thing is you can also aggregate. So one example is, let's say, temperature. So we might need certain aggregations. Uh, we need some, uh, we need the resolution for certain pattern recognition. I don't know if actually we have that. It's just one of the things why we do this. Is that you can still do the pattern recognition here. This is a server, actually Spark Structure Streaming runs here. So you can do the pattern recognition, but of course you don't need, on a historical data, you don't need that resolution. So you aggregate up for 10 seconds, one second, or sometimes, in some cases, 10 minutes. Yeah, so for instance, for us, uh, one of the examples is we operate a very small cluster in the factory. Basically, it's a container where we have machines. And you can run uh, Kafka there uh, for middle ground aggregation, middle ground buffering. And then you can run a Spark, uh, like structure streaming or actually anything. So this is a Linux server. And then we send up, and on the other side, you can have another uh, streaming application. Currently, we don't have, but the theory is that. And did you start the predictions up on the dashboard that you have designs in your app that you showed? So yes, that's the plan. Because this is in research. What we do is we collect that in a file. And what we do is that later we try to, because you have some, so, you have, when, so when the machine breaks, it happens like, maybe two months from now. So we have to do the predictions and things. And then once we have a positive sample, you have to do the comparison, basically. You have to get the two files, not the one file and the, and the positive sample, and see how you did before, like two months before that. So currently, we don't have that on UI, because there's just, it's just we, don't, we are not, we are not uh, confident enough to say that, hey, you have to order this really I mean, the CNC machine that I mentioned, this is one example, it costs more than half a million euro per machine. So obviously, we don't really want to mess with, with the manufacturer. And we have to be very risk aversive. So one of the reasons why we are only in research mode for the last well, quite some time is because manufacturing is extremely risk aversive. So the factory cannot stop. And anything that even just gets close to the manufacturing line, they're very, very uh, conservative, which is a good thing. I mean, you don't want, this is, a, this is a risky thing. So we just, currently we just collect it, not in a file, actually in Kafka, but same thing. Okay. And what type of machine learning model do you want to discover the pattern for breakdowns? Um, you mean in, uh, right now in the factory? Oh yeah, in this case, it was a boosting, but we, we are, because it's a reason, so we try multiple things, and we have to, well, oh no, sorry, this is here. So actually, what we use is we have different models, and we have different levels of how we can explain those models, and usually it's not just the evaluation that works, it's what you can explain. So if you ever work in the financial sector or risk management, this is pretty much the same problem. So I am not, I'm, I'm not sure about what, like, what are the current ones that are running. Because I mean, probably this is a good, good time to tell you that, I, by the way, I'm a data engineer, not a data scientist. So I just I know enough about machine learning. But uh, we try different ones. And these are actually the same time series methods that we used before. So there is nothing uh, explicit. Only the difference is the explainability, uh, how, you can, how well you can explain the f how features are weighted and things like that. I don't know if I answered your question somewhat. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for attending. Matei, thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you.